for that song and, um, and for reminding us where our focus and where our heart is, is supposed to be. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, it is now. Wonderful, wonderful song tonight. Second Chronicles in chapter number one. If you're able to stand, I'd like to invite you to do that this evening. I want to read verses 13 through 17 uh, tonight is our text. We'll kind of, um, I'll just kind of let you know, I, I, the, the message this evening will be, um, in, in, in a lot of respects, it's going to be a testimonial type of message, uh, more of a personal testimony kind of a message rather than a contextual message. I'm going to, I'll explain that more as we get through here, but, uh, uh, but I am going to be using all of it we find in, in, in our text in verses 13 through 17, then I'm going to be kind of, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to skip ahead. I know something about Solomon's life and some of the things that went on. So I'm going to kind of use uh, Solomon, his kind of his entire life as, um, as part of our text as we go through this. So it's not going to be, te- it's not going to be strictly a, co- a textual message where I just preach and from, from this text and show you one thing after the other from this text. Well, let's go ahead and read this, starting in verse uh, 13. The Bible says, Then Solomon came from his journey to the high place that was at Gibeon. So remember what he had done. And after he's crowned king, um, he goes to, from Jerusalem to a place called Gibeon, and there he offers a thousand sacrifices. And after he's offered those sacrifices, God uh, came to him in a vision and asked and, 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 and gave Solomon the opportunity, Ask what you will, I'll give it to you. He asked for wisdom to lead that great people, and he also asked that God's promise to his father David would be established, and that was that, that someone from the throne of David would sit on, uh, on the throne of Jerusalem forever, from the family of David, would sit on the throne in Jerusalem forever. Uh, Lord, um, establish that promise. Keep your promise. Give me wisdom to do my part in this, in this work. God answered his prayer, and, um, and now we find Solomon returning. The Bible says, Then Solomon came from his journey to the high place that was at Gibeon, to Jerusalem, from before the tabernacle of the congregation, and reigned over Israel. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, which he placed in the chariot cities and, the, and with the king at Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenty as the stones, and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the, va- in the vale of abundance, for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn, and the king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price, and they fetched up and brought forth out of Egypt a chariot for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150, and so brought they out horses for all the kings of the Hittites and for, for the kings of, of Syria by their means. Now let's pray. Father, I want to ask you tonight now that you will uh, use the message. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, Lord. Uh, for all of your word. Sometimes uh, we get kind of a little bit picky about things we like and don't like and passages that are favorites and some passages that maybe are harder to to learn from, so we kind of leave them alone. I just want to thank you for all of your word. I'm going to ask you, Heavenly Father, tonight (laughs) that you will uh, use this message to bring honor to your Son, Jesus Christ. May Jesus be lifted. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. (coughs) I want you to notice in verse number 13, that first sentence where it says, Then Solomon came from his journey to the high place that was Gibeon to Jerusalem. And I want you to notice in in verse 13 that that first phrase, the words from his journey, they um, they are in italics. Notice that most. I think everyone here, most everyone here, will know this. The reason why they're italicized like that is, is because when the, the translators of the King James version did their work, they're translating from uh, from Greek from a Greek manuscript into the English language, and they're they've been using they in their work they used some um, some translations from uh, Greek to Spanish, and they're using some span uh, translations from Greek to German. And they're using, they've also got at their possession some, um, some, some pr- translations uh, from the Greek to English that had been done previous to their day. 
Uh, and they've got all of that to compare and to work with. So they've got the Greek manuscript uh, in front of them. And the Greek manuscript they used is called the Texas Receptus. And so what it happened, it's called receipt. Texas Receptus means received text. It was the text that, at that time, up until then, had been considered um, the correct one. Not that that was the only one, but it was the correct one. It was a compilation of all of the thousands of old manuscripts of the Bible that are brought together, they agreed with each other and compiled, compiled together and, and accepted and received as, uh, as a, an accurate and, um, and, um, and faithful transmission of God's Word. And they're translating from that great text, but they're also using these other things to help them away, along the way. And, and um, the translation work, it's not like I can tell you, it's not like I'm an expert on these things, but the translation work uh, ne necessarily, it is not a like a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, it's not possible to translate from Greek to English word-for-word -word and make it have any sense. It's like, um, you know, when uh, Sergio, when uh, Nuno was here, uh, to translate from uh, English to, to Spanish or from Spanish to English, you can't just, you know, uh, in, to interpret, you can't just say the word that, you know, I say an English word and he says it, it wouldn't make any sense in Spanish. And uh, so there's, because the languages are constructed differently, you have to kind of, uh, in, in your interpretation work, when uh, Nuno tries to interpret from English into Spanish or Spanish into English, he has to, in his head, figure out how to make what makes sense in Spanish make sense in English. He's got to do that as he's doing, as he's going along with the work. And, and uh, the translators had to do that same thing. You can't just take the Greek text and translate it into, uh, into English word for word and, have, and come up with something that will make any sense. And so they use what is called dynamic translation. So they, uh, they, they give us, they, they study the, the, the manuscript and then they in the manuscript, they, um, uh, they, they try to faithfully preserve what God is communicating in Greek or in the Greek manuscript into the English language. And sometimes that um, presents challenges, presented challenges for them. And so they would, um, they would supply words that are not in the text so that the English text makes sense. And when they did that, the translators of the King James Version, when they did that, they took those words, they, they turned those words that they supplied, they put them in italics. And that was a matter of them wanting to be honest to you and me so that we would know uh, what they did. They're not trying to hide. They're not trying to change the Word of God. They're not trying to add to the Word of God, subtract from the Word of God. They're, they're, they're trying to handle the Word of God honestly and present to you and me an, uh, uh, a Bible in the English language that we can read that makes sense to us, but by supplying things, like, by putting certain phrases in, uh, that aren't in the text, but putting them in italics, we're able to see this is supplied to give us understanding, to help us to understand. They believe that the context and rendering of the text required the addition of these words to give the full meaning, give the full meaning of the passage. So in my mind, I do not believe it's wise to, I'm gonna call it, play with the text and remove phrases like this. The phrases from his journey. I think that's, let me look at, from his journey. I don't think it's wise to just say, well, let's just, since that's not in the, uh, in the, in the original, it's not there, let's just go ahead and skip it and read, then Solomon came to uh, the high place uh, that was at Gibeon to Jerusalem. Let's just skip it. I don't, I don't think that's wise. I think that the translators saw something in the, in, in the, in the manuscript, in their translation work, saw something there that required this to be supplied. And I don't really think it makes sense for us to, to, to remove it. I, uh, if you disagree with me, I'm not going to argue a great deal about that. You know, I do understand it was supplied, and 
you know, and so there are plenty of Bible students that what they'll do is they'll say, well, let's just take that phrase out and see how it reads then. It might read, make more sense to us. We want to be able to learn something. Well, if it, you know, just because something we can, just because something makes sense to, to us doesn't mean that that's what God meant. And so, um, I, anyway, I, so I have a little bit of an issue. I don't think it's wise to play with the text by removing them um, because, again, I don't think they're adding to the Bible. They're, they're just giving us context so that, we, that, w- that would otherwise be missing um, from the English text and helping us to understand the Word of God better. So um, what he says here is that Solomon, so here's, a, here's the, Solomon had gone from Jerusalem. He's king now. He's talked to all of the major players, his staff and administration, and he's talked to the congregation. And they've, after his coronation, they've gone from Jerusalem, where the coronation took place, they've gone to Gibeon, to the high place where the tabernacle is, and they've offered this sacrifice the Lord. And, um, and, um, and now it says, the Bible says, Solomon came from his journey uh, to the high place that was at Gibeon. And so what that means is, you know, it's a, Gibeon, it wasn't next door, it's a journey. It's a journey. Um, uh, it was a journey from Jerusalem to Gibeon. It was a journey from Gibeon back to Jerusalem. And again, since the word is supplied, we can't go to the, to the Greek and be able to look up in the Greek what the word journey means. It's not, because uh, it's not in the manuscript. We can't look, look it up like that. And, um, and so what I did is I just looked up the word journey in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the word journey like this. He says, I'm gonna give you three definitions that he gives. He says, um, uh, a day's travel, or travel by land to any distance and for any time indefinitely, or passage from one place to another, as in a long journey. What he's saying is, Gibeon isn't right next to Jerusalem. This isn't just a Sunday outing. In fact, I looked it up, um, and the distance between Gibeon and Jerusalem is approximately 100 miles. You know, there's a, um, some play with that, but it's approximately 100 miles from Jerusalem to Gibeon, then 100 miles from Gibeon back to Jerusalem. That's a 200-mile trip. Remember, they didn't have jet airplanes, and uh, they didn't have, you know, uh, cars and things like that, and so this would have been uh, on horse. It would have been on, you know, he hasn't got his chariots yet. It would have been on horse, on mule. It would have been on foot, and it's a whole bunch of people that are going to this thing. This is not just a little outing that they've gone to. 100 miles, one each way, is not just a little thing to do. And, And again, since the the phrase is supplied. Um, while I don't think we want to remove the phrase, I think that it is appropriate for me to use the phrase and to preach from the phrase, but I do think I can ask for a little bit of liberty tonight, since it is supplied, and so I'd like to, um, to ask for a little bit of liberty for, from you in my construction, and again, I know that this journey was made at the beginning of his reign, and I know that his, this journey was a specific one that he made where he went from Jerusalem to Gibeon, and then from Gibeon back to Jerusalem to begin his reign as the king, and I know that this journey ended before he ever built the temple, but I, I just want to uh, ask you, if you will, to so let me, um, let me play with that idea of a long journey a little bit tonight and just speak about the journey called life. You know, Christian life isn't just showing up to go to a church service and go back home. You know that? Christianity isn't just, well, I, I went to church Sunday morning. It, Christianity is a whole lot more than you just sit through a service. Uh, Part of what we do as Christians is we come to church and we listen to a message, we sing some songs. That's part of what Christianity is, but that is only a small part of what, of what Christianity is. And uh, Christianity, really, the Christian life is a journey. And it's a significant one. It, it, I mean, it, it has some, it's a long one. It, it, there are some bumps and bruises along the way, and there are some detours that come up, and there are some hills to climb, and some, and some grades we have to, you know, coast down. Thinking coasting is all, you know, down always seems like the easy thing to do. Coasting can sometimes get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, uh, a few years ago, I'm, I'm, I, I, didn't, 
I still exercise all the time. I'm try, trying to justify this, but I, I don't ride the bike as much as I used to. But not for a number of reasons. I don't ride my bike as much as I used to. I do other kinds of exercise now. But one of the things I learned, riding bicycle is dangerous. So, so while I was riding bike, I was actually kind of looking into doing it. I wanted to ride from coast to coast. I was thinking about riding from San Diego to Florida, to um, Jacksonville, Florida. And here was my thinking. It's because, you know, I'm riding my bike to get healthy. And I just read about, and you know, it takes like two months to do, and you go from being fat to fit. That quick. Seemed like a good idea to me. Get this thing over with, you know. <laughs> just, you know, just get her done. <laughs> and then go on with life and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so I was looking into that, but, uh, but I, I, I did. I followed a guy that he actually didn't do it down south. He, he did it from Anacortes. He started in Anacortes, and he was, his plan was to ride to Maine. And when he was crossing the Great Divide, he and another guy went together. In fact, I, uh, you know, followed them and saw pictures of them when they were in Anacortes, you know, these two guys riding together. And, and guys who ride, you know, I guess when you do it enough, and you don't um, stay right together talking the whole time. Different guys ride at different speeds and so forth. And so uh, one of the guys got significantly ahead of the other one. And, uh, you know, each night they'd be camping at a spot. And so they went to the Great, got to the great Divide. And, and, um, and the first guy, the, got, he went over the Great Divide, got down to the campsite, made, made camp. And, and waited, and a couple hours later, the other fellow isn't there yet, so he gets back on his bike and rides back up, and um, the other guy wrecked, coasting down, and broke his neck. And yeah, he's, he's, um, cri he's paralyzed from the neck down now. And uh, by the way, he still rides bike, just not on the roads anymore. So anyway, that, so those sorts of things. I got run off the road a couple of times. And so, uh, you know, life, uh, coasting isn't always a safe thing. You think, wow, man, just I can't wait till that downhill and it's going to be. But coasting isn't always a great thing either. And so life has, you know, some challenges involved in it. And, 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 and so here's the premise um, that I'm going to try to make with this kind of the outline I'm thinking of in my message this evening. Uh, Solomon's coronation is going to be likened to his salva salvation, uh, his gathering the co congregation to go to Gibeon. I'm going to liken that to, you know, the concept of church membership, his journey, um, uh, his journey to Gibeon and back. I'm going to liken that to his life uh, that, that he's living now as a king and as a believer and all that. I'm going to liken those things together. And so with that kind of an idea that what we're doing is we're looking at the journey called life and, and I'm just getting it from his journey and taking that journey and now he's the king and he's offered and God uh, his sacrifices and, and God has met with him and, and God has promised to bless him and now he, go, he begins to live his Christian life. He begins to live for Christian life for us but his life as the king and the lessons that he learned along the way. Let's look at Solomon's journey and, and see if we can make some application. So first thing I notice is that, um, that Solomon Glorified, glorified God on the way. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before the Lord, uh, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation. He offered a thousand burnt offerings upon him. I'm just going to say, that's going to glorify the Lord. I mean, that's no small sacrifice. A thousand animals. Uh, by anyone's standard, that would be quite an amazing feat to, to have been involved in, to see and to experience and to be a part of that. And uh, You know, I'm just thinking about that when um, early Early on in the Christian life, the amazing things that happen early on in the person's Christian life. I'm thinking about my own life when I became a believer, and um, the amazing things that seem like God did early on as a, when I became a Christian. First of all, baptism, and just you know, I mean, the, some of the things with baptism, you know what they do? They just put you in a tank and they just dunk you and pick you back up. No big deal like that. And uh, but I'm just going to tell you, to me, um, this is a big deal. I got baptized. I was 21 years old when I got back. 22, maybe. Um, I can't remember exactly now. Uh, I got. It was on Anita's birthday that I was baptized. 1979 is when I is uh, on the, the day of my baptism, and and um, now I wasn't as heavy back then as I am now, but I was still a big man. I um, lifted weights back then, did bodybuilding stuff, so I was about 220 pounds um, and pretty fit in those days. About 220 pounds. Uh, my goal was to weigh 240. I was, you know, eating, drinking a dozen raw eggs every morning and lifting weights every morning and lifting weights every night. And 
and uh, trying to get up to 240 pounds uh, anymore. I, my goal is still 240. It's just the other way now. And, uh, and uh, but uh, uh, you know, so I was. Uh, I'm getting baptized. I'm a, and I know that I'm a big guy. I know that at this point in my life, I'm a big guy. My pastor, um, in, a, in his younger days, he had been an avid snow skier, but he was not a very big guy, and he did not strike me as being very athletic. He just wasn't. Uh, didn't seem like an athletic kind of guy. I had never seen anyone baptized before. I, I knew that uh, uh, that they baptized in a in a in a baptistry tank. It's a big tank of water. I knew that they did that. So, but I'd never seen anyone baptized before, and I knew nothing about. I'm going to call it hydraulics. There there's some hydraulics involved in, in baptism, and and uh, and uh, I knew nothing about those things. And I was almost certain that my pastor would not be able to lift me back up out of the water. I was pretty sure I was big. He was little and that he was going to put me under the water and drop me. I was just pretty sure that was what was going to happen. And so we got to, we borrowed, the, our church was just starting, so there was no baptistry in our church building. We went to another church and borrowed their baptistry uh, uh, for the service. And, and, um, and, and um, uh, the baptistry that we use is much larger, much larger than the one that, that we have right here. Uh, it, was, it's, it wasn't a swimming pool, but it was uh, quite a bit, it was pretty close to a swimming pool size there. And uh, so we got, into that, we got into that water, and I noticed right away, one of the first things I noticed in there is there was no place for me to grab hold. I, you know, in my mind, I thought, I'm going to have to help him. And uh, he's not going to be able to pick me back up. He's going to do, I'll baptize thee in the name, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's going to put me underwater, and then he's going to go like this, and I'm not going to be there. And I could just envision myself struggling and splashing and, you know, and spreading out water and all those things. So I'm trying to figure out how in the world am I going to help him to get, uh, to get me baptized and, all that, and, and get all that done so that I go under and come back in a, in a standing position with some dignity. I always tell people this baptism, you know, is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what happens when we baptize, we, we, a person gets baptized, they're put underwater. That pictures death. We bring them back out of water. Um, uh, no, that's not. That picture is burial. We bring them back out of the water. That pictures uh, resurrection. Putting on that silly baptism robe pictures death. And so, but in my mind, I'm just thinking, you know what? Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to make a fool out of myself right now, and that's just. Gonna, and there are some great stories. I mean, baptism stories. This hadn't all happened to me. I'm thankful it hadn't happened to me. But uh, I've had some. I've heard some great baptism stories. I heard a story about a lady getting baptized. She wore a wig, and I don't know why. She just thought she didn't want to, you know, she wanted to, you know, have, you know, look pretty and all that kind of stuff. So she gets ready to get baptized, and uh, she didn't take off her wig. And so she goes underwater. When she comes back up, she came without the wig. And when my pastor's pastor, Jim Duncan, tells a story, he said, and he just couldn't think of what to do, so he just grabbed the wig and flopped it on her head like that, <laughs> which didn't help anything. And so she never came back to church, you know, that kind of, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, just some, some kinds of stories like that. One time he was baptizing, but was Scott, Pastor Duncan was talking about baptizing. I have some good Pastor Duncan's baptism stories. I won't go through them all. But I will tell you another one. He's baptizing a husband and wife, and the baptistry set up. They have changing um, compartments in behind the baptistry, you know, behind the curtains and all this room back there. And they had con changing compartments, but uh, how they done, there were no walls. They just hung some ropes and some, and some sheets off of them. And uh, so he's getting ready. They're in there changing. The, one of them's getting ready to, to get baptized, and the other one is changing clothes to be baptized. And while the one that's getting ready to get baptized, as he go, gets ready to get into the baptistry, he kind of slips and he grabs a hold of, uh, of the curtain and he pulled the whole thing down. His wife trying to change into the robe. <laughs> Death. <laughs> Burial. And resurrection. And so I'm just, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking to myself, I mean, I am dying to myself. I know that. But I sure would like to come out of this with some dignity. Baptist, right? Sure like to come out of it with a little bit of dignity. I, I also... Um, I'd never, like I said, I'd never uh, seen anyone baptized, and, 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 and this whole Christian thing, it was, uh, it was new to me, and it was wonderful to me, but I wonder what would happen to me spiritually when I got baptized, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, I don't know, I wonder if when you go under, you come back up, maybe the, like the sun 
shines through the building and lights, you know, there's special glowing lights from heaven. Or, um, you know, maybe there'll be some kind of warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, like uh, charismatic tongues or something. And, uh, or maybe I'd hear a voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And, uh, or, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'd come up from the, the, the baptistry waters victorious over sin, no more sin problems. I'd had some sin problems. <laughs> Maybe I'd come out of the water and I'd be just totally different and no struggles anymore, no problem with, with, with sin or anything like that. What I, what I discovered is that baptism is a profession of faith and baptism is the first step of Christian obedience and baptism is a promise that the Christian makes to live and walk as God teaches us in the Word of God and to walk in newness of life. There, there were no um, bright lights in the sky and there were no warm fuzzies except, except for an answer of a good conscience. You know, you did the right, when you do the right thing, it, it, it just feels right to do the right thing. And so there was that. There was no voice from heaven, um, you know, anything like that. Uh, uh, and, oh, and by the way, the pastor had no problem picking me up. Who knew? The bigger you are, the easier you float. And so, and uh, so he come right back up real easy, and so uh, it wasn't any problem at all. Uh, but you know, what an what an incredible experience! What a, what a wonderful experience! And then church membership in a Baptist church, baptism uh, in a Baptist church, baptism come with baptism comes membership. So we're baptized into the membership of a of a local Baptist church. And once a person has been baptized scripturally, you never have to get baptized again. You joined by statement of faith then, but, but that first time when you're baptized with the baptism, you're automatically receiving the membership of the church, and with membership comes a brand new family. It's a, you know, I mean, it's not, a, it's not, it, I, I was gonna, almost said it's not a blood family, but it is. It's a, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it's a, it's a brand new family. And that first church that I went to, I got baptized, I said it's just getting started. There were uh, 10 or 12 people that came to the church, something like that, and, um, and, and, and they were a test for me. These 10 or 12 people, they were a test for me. They were entirely different than anybody I had ever met in my life. I grew up in a rodeo family, cowboy family. I was an iron worker by trade. And these people were just a different type of people than I had ever been around before. Um, um, pastor was a little bit different. I mean, I love my pastor, and uh, but he is just a little bit different than anyone I'd ever been around before. And, and uh, the people that, all of these folks were different. Uh, the Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 3, and verse 14, we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brother. And then the Bible says, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And so the Bible tells me that one of the ways I can tell whether I'm really saved or not is do I love all of these people? <clears throat> and, um, and, and I'm just going to tell you, some of those first people were a little bit tough to love. I'm going to just tell you a couple of stories. First of all, Pastor Scudder. So um, early on in my Christian experience, Pastor, we had a revival meeting, and, um, and, and Brother Rose was the evangelist. I'd never met an evangelist before, and, and, uh, and Pastor knew that I belonged to a men's club. It was, uh, it was an exercise club. I belonged to an exercise club. It's a racquetball and tennis court and, um, you know, and um, weights and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, you know, a place to run and all that kind of stuff was there. And Pastor knew that I belonged there. So he said, and he knew that, that Brother Rose likes sporting thing, so he said, well, we, asked me if I'd be willing to, uh, to host uh, Brother Rose to the, you know, play racquetball, and so I, I, had, I, I wasn't really a racquetball player, I, I had a racket and, and all that stuff because I belonged to the club, but I didn't, wasn't, it wasn't my thing, but, um, so we had Brother Rose come, and, um, and uh, you know, Pastor Scudder, um, he just decided he had no business in, the, in a court with Brother Rose and me. Uh, so he just walked out, and I don't remember, don't know what he did, but he didn't stay there. Brother um, Rose and I played a game or two, and then he got bored. And um, so I played racquetball. I finished playing a game of racquetball with another guy in the room, and when I got done, I came out, and Brother Rose was in, there was a lounge area where, you know, not drinking, but uh, it was a place where they had pool, and Brother Rose had already hustled everybody there, and no one would play pool with him anymore. <laughs> it's just kind of, <laughs> you know, a pastor has absolutely no athletic skill, and this guy here is a hustler. <laughs> kind of a 
Then there was Mike Riggs, and Mike was the guy that invited me to go to church the very first time. He's my work partner. He's the guy who discipled me. I still consider him my best friend, and, uh, but boy, he'd sure lay into me if he thought I was doing wrong. He'd let me know. And there was another guy by the name of Mike Mullaney in the church. He was a single fellow, and um, <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike had been, Mike rode motorcycles. I rode a motorcycle back then, too, and so Mike and I rode bikes together a little bit, but, uh, but before he got saved, Mike had, was on a motorcycle gang. <laughs> he said they would go to churches on Sunday mornings, and they would rob stuff out of, church, out of the cars in the church parking lot. He says they were, it's a great place to steal stuff because Christians, number one, you know exactly where they are and how long they're going to be there, and they're trusting enough they leave their cars unlocked. So it's really easy to just go through the church parking lot uh, during church services and steal stuff out of their cars. And So he, he's like one of my groomsmen in our wedding a little bit later on. And uh, that kind of a guy. Then there was Buck and Pat Hollander. Buck Hollander was a, was a, a pipe fitter helper. And I don't know how to explain the difference between crafts, um, trades. I'm an iron worker. Pipe fitters are like mortal enemies of iron workers. And uh, so an iron worker, we're taught... You don't trust a toothpick, carpenter. Anything made of wood, never trust anything made of a wood or someone who made it. You don't trust a toothpick. Electricians are thieves. They steal your work. Electricians, I don't know why they could do it, but they're just prima donnas. Electricians, it's just about, you know, they got, electricians got to do iron worker work. Yeah, I, got, give it, I might camp here for this one. But I just, you know, you know, I mean, iron workers got to do cranes, except for when electricians were working with cranes, and they got to use their own cranes, you know. Iron workers put up structures, except for when electricians need to, and then electricians get to put up their own structures. It's just not, I mean, it's just not fair. And so that bothered us. And, but pipe fitters. They are the mortal enemies, and Buck was a pipe fitter helper, and um, Buck would ask, he would ask pastors some of the stupidest questions. In fact, I, I'm stupid enough, I'm embarrassed even, I remember one or two of them, and I'm not going to tell them to you, because uh, they're just, I mean, it's, they were just meant to cause problems in church. Uh, Buck would just ask questions publicly, meant to embarrass pastor, and, uh, you know, and, and, and cause him to stutter and stammer, stammer and stuff like that. Then, talking about pipe fitters, there was Phil and Chris Swires, and Phil was a pipe fitter pipe fitter. Technically speaking, Phil and I wouldn't talk on the job, but you know, we would, but I mean, it, it, we shouldn't, you know, we're, I mean, uh, a pipe fitter, no, I'll just say, I'll say, iron workers do what everyone else is either too coward or too weak to do, and pipe fitters take all of our best work. Anything that we would want to do that would be good work, they got it. And so, anyway, we're just pipe fitters. Anyway, um, got a couple of friends, uh, pastor friends who were pipe fitters and things like that. But Phil was a pipe And Phil, here, you know, so I'm just, I, listen, I'm, I'm 21 years old. But I've never gone to church like this my entire life. And I'm going to this little church. It's 10 people meeting in, in the pastor, 10 or 12 people meeting in the pastor's living room. And every service, and, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm just starting to go to church. I don't mind going to church. I want to go to church. Sunday morning is not a problem. Mike is bringing me to church on Sunday morning to make sure that I get to church. Sunday morning is not a problem. But I got a girlfriend. I want to go see her sometimes too. And I got a wife beside, you know, I go to work and I work five days a week. I got a girlfriend that I want to see and I've got some other things, some other interests in my life as well. And my, uh, Phil Swires would walk up to me after every service and he would go like, he'd grab my hand and he'd say, see you next service, won't we, Brother Marvin? Hold on to my hand and nod like this. Well, it just seemed rude to go and so I'd say yes, and so, you know, and so I'd say yes, and well, now that I said yes, that meant I had to come to, so pretty, he's got me going to church, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, that is not part of my plan, and it's all because of pipe fitter that I'm going to church that much. And Phil Swires. Then there was Mr. and Mrs. Turner. And Brother Sister Turner, I've got some great stories about Brother and Sister Turner. But one of, Brother Turner, every Sunday night, Pastor would ask people, you know, to do memory verses if a if person, person have a verse wants to quote or something like that. And, and, and Brother Turner would, every, every Sunday night, he would quote the 23rd Psalm. Like, you know, there is a whole Bible besides that, Brother Turner. But he had that one down, you know, and he would just quote that. There was another guy who was an elderly fellow, single, uh, that came to church. I don't know, can't remember his name right now. But <laughs> he knew I was a certified iron worker, certified welder. And so he just would rub it in and say, you know what a certified welder is, don't you? That's somebody who can't weld dirty, dirty iron. 
you're a certified welder, you're a sissy welder. You know, he's a real blessing. <laughs> See me? <laughs> but there was another guy, I, I still, I almost can get this guy's name, I don't remember it now. Uh, uh, there was another guy, he, would, he wasn't a member of the church, he would just come and visit once in a while. And, uh, but he was a, kind of a, he was a Christian, been around for a long time, everybody knew him and in a different church, he'd go in, in from Alaska, but he'd come down and visit sometimes. So one day, you know, I'm a new Christian, so he takes me out to lunch one day, and out to lunch with this guy, now he's trying to disciple me and tell me in my, in my faith, and here's what he tells me, he says, he says, listen, I view every human being as a wallet, and my job is to get as much money out of that wallet as I can. <laughs> he told me, oh, it's a pastor, and say, this guy is a crook, and he says, just consider him broken. Just, you know, don't get mad at him. Just consider that he's broken and things. <laughs> and so, but I look back, you know, the funny thing, I mean, all of them, they just had challenges about it. In my mind, you know, I was the only guy in the whole place that had any sense to me at all, you know, any sense at all. And, but you know what? I loved those people. I absolutely could not wait to get back to church. Mrs. Hollander, she would fix me food every week. Brother and Sister Turner, they would fix this stuff to fix me things to eat. I love those people. I couldn't wait to get back to my little church in that time like that. So I mean, baptism and church membership. Then there was there was um, tithing. <laughs> I just gotta, yeah. Um, you and I have been going to church long enough that you know, that it, that we've forgotten. Almost certainly, we have forgotten the shock <laughs> when someone explained to us that God wants 10% of our income every week <laughs> to start with. <laughs> That's where we start. We're robbing God if we don't give 10% of our income to him. We're robbing God. I learned that. I learned, Mike told, Riggs told me that. Before the first time, I, he had invited me to come to church. I said I'd come to church with him, agreed to come to church. And then he told me about tithing. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't work. I'm working on a job. And, and I've got all these other guys and, that i you know friends with and from the old days when I wasn't a Christian and all that kind of stuff. And so now they know I'm going to go to church. And now because of Mike, they know that I'm going to go to church. And I'm supposed to give 10% of my income to, church, to the church. And, uh, and so I come, I come back to work then after the first Sunday. And Bobby Olson comes up and says, how much did you give? <laughs> Just wanted to check up on me. Did you honestly give 10% of that paycheck? Well, yeah, I did, and uh, and I just kept doing that over and over. It took years before I found out a good answer for those people who say, you know, that's the fool most foolish thing I've ever heard. You give 10% of your income to church? That's really stupid to do that. Um, a, a friend of mine now by the name of Wayne Ward said someone challenged him like that. said, that you're a fool to give 10% of your income to church. And he says, oh, yeah? I'll tell you what. Um, I'll add up how much church money I give to church this month, and you add up how much money you give to your tavern this month. And so we'll see who's the fool. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it's just an amazing thing. Witnessing, uh, w uh, just the things that happen early on. Every, every day at work, Mike Riggs and I, we would uh, sit down, and we called it an eating shack, and we'd sit down in the eating shack with all these other iron workers, and we would talk about the messages we heard at church. And because we'd talk about them out loud, openly, and the, our, the rest of our gang, our crew was there, and we, they would hear what we were talking about and so forth. We got to lead several witness to a lot of people and lead several to the Lord. One of the people that we led to the Lord was Forrest Jenkins, my, our, our foreman's uh, son, he was listening to us he, and, and heard, heard us talking about what our pastor was preaching and said, man, and came up to us privately and said, you know what, uh, I'm getting ready to marry a Catholic girl and, her, and for me to marry her, I have to take Catholic classes and the uh, pastor was preaching on the book of Revelation and how the, the great horror of Revelation is, uh, is the Catholic church and he says, I just want to go find out about that. And so he came and got saved, and uh, uh, Forrest got saved, and uh, just, I mean, ex wonderful, wonderful experiences, and, uh, you know, that early on in the Christian life, or early on, um, some of those things kind of after a while, you, they just become old hat. You know, we, man, tithing, I still tithe. Nobody asked me, well, did you really do that anymore? And nobody asked me. I still witness. 
but it's now it's kind of a routine. Early on, those things are such a major thing in our, in our lives, our spiritual life. So there's right off the bat, Solomon glorifies God. He gives his life to the Lord and begins doing things to bring honor to the name of the Lord. And then secondly, he made some progress along his journey. On the journey uh, in his life, he made some progress on the way in 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 1. And just because I read it now doesn't mean I'm not going to preach on it later, but uh, in, uh, as we study through here, but in 2 Chronicles Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 1, Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And so then Solomon begins this work of uh, building the temple, Lord willing. I'll try to address that subject, building the temple a little bit more in a few weeks. But right now I'm just thinking about the, the change that's going to happen from the tabernacle in Gibeon to the temple in Jerusalem. And there's some real progress happening, in spiritual progress happening uh, in the life of Solomon and in the life of the nation that he's leading. I just want to ask you, do you remember um, when you got saved? The progress, the things that have changed in your life since then. For, for me, for me, there were so many things that changed so quickly. Yeah, I, uh, God changed how I spoke, and God changed what I ate and drank, and God changed where I went on my free time, and God changed my friendships, and all of those kind of things. One day, Mike Riggs and I were um, um, got into... A, I don't want to talk about a conversation because it wasn't a conversation. It was him telling me what the Bible said and me getting mad is what it was. But uh, we, got into a, yeah, we got into it about the subject of drinking, uh, drinking alcohol. And I told him how I knew this. I mean, I, would, I don't know how I even knew this, but I knew this. People who don't know the Bible and who don't know Jesus do know some things that the Bible says. It's their little things that help them, you know, justify what they're doing. And uh, he, we're talking, and I, and I told him, I said, Jesus turned water into wine. There is nothing at all wrong with drinking. If Jesus turned water into wine, then, he's, then he has, uh, you know, authorized us to drink wine. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of beer. There's nothing wrong with having a little wine. There's nothing wrong with having a little whiskey. As long as it's done in moderation, it's okay to do those things. Now, Mike wasn't even a little bit afraid to confront me and he, uh, to the face, and he did it on a regular basis. When I was wrong, he would tell me. This time, he didn't do that. All he did is gave me a book called Sipping Saints. I read the book, and when I finished the book, I no longer drink alcohol. Um, we never discussed it again, but it convinced me and I, and I quit drinking alcohol. But Anita and I were dating in those days, and, and our dates, most of our dates were at places that served alcohol. And, and you know, and I had already gone, I mean, I had already put her through the ringer, you know, told her that, uh, that uh, you know, I wasn't going to date her anymore and, uh, unless she was uh, saved, and I wasn't going to date her anymore unless she went to a Baptist church. And now uh, I was just scared to say, I'm not going to date you anymore unless you stop drinking. We can't go to taverns and bars anymore. And so I was afraid to say anything to her. I hadn't really discussed it. Uh, uh, ready, I, I, I changed, and I wasn't drinking, but I hadn't told you about it. Well, I took her to meet my mom and dad, and uh, we got to the dad's place, and dad offered us a beer, and Anita, I mean, I, 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 he's my dad, I wouldn't have done well, Dad offers us a beer, and Anita just immediately pipes up and says, no, thank you, we don't drink. Well, I knew I didn't, I didn't know she didn't. <laughs> so, and uh, <laughs> now none of that is meant to lift Anita and I in any way. I don't mean that at all. It's just a te it's a testimony of how quickly God changed us and uh, progress along the way. Then um, so there's progress. He he glorified God early and he progress along the way. And then concerning Solomon, he did make some mistakes on his journey as well. Look at. Uh, 2 Chronicles 1 and verse 14. The Bible says Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen and 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen which he placed in chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. So verses 14 through 17, I'm not going to read it all again right now, I did that a little bit, but verses 14 through 17 describe how after he gets back from uh, Gibeon, you know, and God has promised him, you know, he's going to have, because you've asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm also going to give you health, and I'm going to give you wealth, and if you will keep my word, I'm going to give you long life as well. And uh, now he comes back, and the Bible says immediately, one of the first things that he does is he starts to collect 
chariots and horses. And at first glance, that might not seem like a terrible thing. Uh, you know, nothing wrong with having horses and so forth, except that God had given a, a very specific instruction to the king of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 16, by the way, this is an interesting thing. One of the things that God instructed the kings of Israel to do, one of the first things that they were supposed to do when they were crowned is they were supposed to write out their own personal copy of the Bible. Solomon knew God's word. By the time he was crowned king, he would have already written out his own personal copy of what was then the Bible. It's not all the Bible we have now, but of, of the Mosaic Law, the first five books of the Bible. He would have already written all of that out. He knew God's word. Deuteronomy in chapter 17 verse 16 says, But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. God says specifically the king of, of, of Jerusalem, a king of Israel, he is not to multiply to himself horses and chariots. And here it is. Solomon, right off the bat, he is multiplying to himself uh, chariots and horses. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, says this. He says, um, he gathered chariots and horsemen. Shall we praise him for this? We praise him not. For the king was forbidden to multiply horses. And it's still quoting, I do not remember that ever we find his good father in a chariot or on horseback. A mule was the highest he ever mounted, end quote. Matthew Henry adds another point. He said that's unrelated to the message tonight, but I think it's worthwhile in, in, in this whole thing about the horses. He said, uh, he's talking about, you know, that the highest that David ever mounted was a mule, and here's Solomon, you know, multiplying horses. Here's what uh, Matthew Henry says. He says, we should endeavor to excel those that went before us in goodness, not grandeur. Make sense to you? We should seek to excel those before us who've gone before us in goodness. We should strive to take what they've taught us spiritually and, and grow spiritually, but not in grandeur. It's not a matter of us trying to lift ourselves up. One of the most disappointing things I think I've discovered as a Christian is that none of us are perfectly sinless on this journey. Um, we make mistakes is too soft a way to describe it. We sin against God. We offend God. Believers, we're Christians. We've grown as believers and we've glorified God in some ways for believers. We've testified to others that we're believers and maybe won some other people to the Lord. And then we do something that is offensive to God. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, not as though I had already attained, this is the Apostle Paul, he's writing about himself, the great Apostle Paul, he says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. He said, I know I haven't attained perfection, but I am pursuing it. It is what Jesus' desire for me is. I am pursuing to be as holy and godly and as, as, as free from sin as God the Holy Spirit will, will give me ability to do in this life on the earth. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, and verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We are so... Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure. We are so sinlessly, or, uh, this is not going to, we are so imperfect. That's just a better way to say it. Um, we are so imperfect that if we said that we have no sin, we'd be lying. But the good news is, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he Solomon, on his journey, he glorified God on the way, and he made some progress on the way, and he made some mistakes along the way. And then uh, concerning Solomon, he also had some questions on the way. I'm going to go to the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, you don't have to turn there. Uh, it's rather, I'll just kind of give to you one verse to kind of illustrate what I'm saying. But there came a point in Solomon's life where he had some questions. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 3, this is Solomon, and he writes, What profit hath a man of all his labors which he taketh under the sun? 
But here he is. He's a believer. He's got wisdom from God. He's got wealth. He's got honor. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and all of those things. And he comes to a place in his life and says, what good is this? Just what, what use is life anyway? What, what good is it? I, I, can't, I can't get over my sin. I can't be perfect. I can't get over my sin. I disappoint God. I disappoint my family. I disappoint others. Why, why would I even want to keep this up? What profit is there? The old man's labor is under the sun. The King Solomon, he's a writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. He no way tries to paint himself as being better than anyone else. He, he had some questions, and, and those questions really led him into some pretty serious sins. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, he writes and says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under, the, the, under heaven. This sort of travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised with. Just got to a place where he said, you know what, what good is this? And so he gave himself over to worldly things. <clears throat> I've been a Christian now for just about 45 years. I've been in the ministry almost 40 years. I'm going to tell you, um, you're going to have questions. You're going you're to question, um, you're, you're going you're gonna to question what good is all of this. You look around the what things that are going on in the world, you're going to have questions. The devil's going to put some questions in your mind. The world's going to put some questions in your mind. You're going to have friends who question what you're doing as a believer. All that's going to happen. As, a, as long as I've been a Christian, I've never questioned whether God exists, and I'm not questioned heaven or hell. <laughs> and once I did my homework, uh, I've never questioned the subject of the King James Version of the Bible. I did my homework and, and came to my convictions on that. Um, I've because I've done my homework, I have no question that, that the Baptist church is the only kind of church that could possibly trace itself back to the time of Christ and his promise to build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. It cannot possibly exist in any other uh, Christian organization that's in this world today. I've got those things down. I've searched them out thoroughly enough that, that they're not an issue for me, but I've had questions that have nearly sidewailed me along the way um, when people I love turn against me. Or against the Lord. I mean, uh, when when pastors walk away from the faith, it, it, it's it happens so often now um, it, that pastors walk away from the faith. It's it, it turn from the the things they promised to preach at their ordination. It happens so often and now that uh, to be honest with you, I'm I'm afraid to recommend a church to anybody, uh, you know, other than ours because I don't know who has or hasn't changed because they're. It's happening so very often and in so very many ways that Bible colleges change and, and um, you know, they're, we're fundamental and strong and doing the right thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're just, and uh, something's weird going on there. And professing Christians, you've got professing Christians begin ignoring the word of God. I told you this morning, some Christians say, I know what the Bible says, but I don't care. I'm doing this. And those things... They, they hurt me to the core when that kind of stuff happens. And you do start going, well, what is the use? I've discovered that as a preacher, <laughs> I have to live, <clears throat> I've, I call it, I think of it like this, I have to live in almost const, in, a, in a constant sense of failure. And it's because there's no power in human flesh to help anyone. It, uh, it, it's when we're weak that God is strong. And so it's not like I can come to a place and just say, well, you know, I've got your answers. Just do what I'm saying. If I had answers, people wouldn't listen to them anyway. I figured that out a long time ago. Um, this will sound cynical, but um, and may, I'm hopeful it's not anyone in this room, but I have come to a place where I think most people have already determined what they believe, and they don't want a pastor to help them learn God's word and help them to live for Christ. They just want a pastor to be the spokesman for what they believe. They go to a church and they look for a pastor who preaches the things that they believe. Don't preach thing, don't preach it me, pastor. Preach the things that I believe to everyone else. And uh, and and I, I struggle when I see a ministry I respect come to rely on some form of human program in order to have success, you know. Because 
you can't make people do the right thing, and so you come try to get into some program, you know, go to a pastor's conference or a pastor's school or a leadership something or whatever so that we can, you know, show people the right way. And uh, I just like to say whenever, listen, here's the thing. Whenever you have questions and you're going to have them, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Every, every failure is a human failure, not a God failure. Every failure is a human failure, not a God failure. There have been times when I just live by the motto, <laughs> God is, and this is his book. <laughs> I'm not sure of much else, but I know God is, and I know this is where you find him. Right there. I'm reminded of Job chapter 13, verse 15. Job comes to a place in his life, he just says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I will maintain mine own ways before him. When, quest, when quest, questions come, and they will, trust God and stay the course. Just say, though he slay me, I will trust him, and I will maintain my cause before him. Solomon had questions. He messed up, because, but, uh, and because of those questions, but praise the Lord, uh, Solomon also got on his journey. He got some things right with the Lord. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14, the Bible says, he's writing, he says, let us hear the whole conclusion. So he's gone through all this question. He says, I'm going to go out and search. I'm going to go see what's in the world. I'm going to experiment with the world. I'm going to go taste the world and see what's out there. And, and you know, there's, I, I, I've come to a place where I'm not sure where anything's real and anything's true. And so I'm just going to go out and see what the world has to offer. And when he gets done with his experience, with the world, he comes to this place and he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So I, I, I've already gone long enough, I think, so I don't want to go on too much longer in the message this evening, but I want to I just end with um, with with a word um, of encouragement even if you feel like you've gone away from God. Here's the thing. Like Solomon, you can always come back. And it kind of goes along with the message this morning. You know, you've got um, Peter and Judas Iscariot. The difference between the men is Peter turned back to the Lord. And God accepted him, you can always come back. Like the prodigal, you can always come back. No matter what's going on in your life, where you are, you can, listen, and maybe you're not there now, maybe right now you haven't turned away from the Lord, but I'm just telling you, if it happens in your life, just remember this, you can always, you can always, you can always come back. He will always take you back. Let's pray. Father, I want to ask you tonight now that your Holy Spirit will, will bless this evening. I want to thank you, God, for just the testimony that uh, Solomon has and uh, thinking about that whole life on the journey. You know, and I understand I, I took a lot of liberty because we're talking about one journey that happened in his life, but, uh, and then I use that to talk about the journey of his life and our life. And, but Lord, uh, I want to thank you. Um, that in the end of his journey, he came to the conclusion, here's the thing, fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. You can always come back. I trust, Lord, I pray that there are people in this room that, that, um, that are, are so led and protected of the Holy Spirit of God that they never go away. I, I, I don't think it would be even... Um, I, I doubt it would even be reasonable to pray that they never have questions or never are tried because trials are part of growth in the spiritual life. and that's gonna, But I pray, Heavenly Father, that in this group, that this is a group of people who will stay on course and, and uh, will not allow questions and will not allow temptations and will not allow um, the, um, the, 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 the devil or the people around them who begin to try to attempt to push them off course, that they'll not allow someone to pull them off of the course of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a group of people that will stay the course. But Lord, I also pray that if for whatever reason someone here gets off course, that they always remember they're welcome back. 
but you'll always take them back. Heavenly Father, I want to ask you this evening that you bless as we have a few moments of invitation, Lord, um, and um, that you would speak to our hearts in these last few minutes. In Jesus' name.